It was Christians who initiated the modern idea of charity, that is, giving that expected nothing in return. In Greco-Roman culture, giving would be done either to gain favour with someone or to place them in your debt so that you could call in a favour at a later date. But Christianity taught giving for giving's sake because it was Jesus that said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It was Christ's revolutionary teaching to love our enemies that meant that everyone received Christian charity, foes as well as friends, and that kindness often wasn't repaid. Where the Stoic philosophy of Roman culture had made it disrespectful to associate with the weak, poor and downtrodden, Christians regarded all individuals as having equal value no matter what their social status. They were happy to associate with society's underclass just as Jesus had done. It was Christians who therefore founded orphanages. It was Christians who first established homes for the aged. It was Christians, specifically working on Christian principles like Anthony Ashley Cooper, that introduced child labour laws. Anthony Ashley Cooper wrote about his motivation as a young man saying, I want nothing but usefulness to God and my country. Again, if we look to the places where Christianity has had less influence around the world, we see child labour still in effect even today. Carlton Hayes said, From the wellsprings of Christian compassion, our Western civilization has drawn its inspiration and sense of duty for feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, looking after the homeless, clothing the naked, tending the sick, and visiting the prisoner. Before Christianity, there was nothing that we would recognise today as hospitals. The idea of nursing the sick was largely a Christian one. For example, history records three plagues that hit Rome, known as the Antonine Plague, the Cyprian Plague and the Justinian Plague. Historians note that these dark periods were when Christianity experienced its largest surges in growth. Why? Because while pagan Romans abandoned their sick for fear of catching it themselves, Christians had a casual disregard for death and cared for the sick in their own communities and in pagan communities, once more showing love for those who hated them. This meant that Christians themselves had a far higher survival rate, and it also meant that pagan survivors, moved by seeing faith in action, converted to Christianity. Christians also pioneered the idea of humanitarian organisations like the Red Cross. The organisation now operates under the name of the Red Crescent in Muslim countries simply because Muslims might be offended by the cross symbol. Yet the majority of charity organisations, particularly of the oldest variety, have Christian roots. Where Christians have pioneered, others have followed. And I recommend that you do some research on this claim for yourself. Christians were the first to believe in formally educating both men and women. W. M. Ramsey says that Christianity's aim was universal education, not education confined to the rich as among the Greeks and Romans, and it made no distinction of sex. This was a radical concept. Prior to Christianity, education was generally for the rich and for the male only, but Christianity changed things. It was Martin Luther, the Christian reformer, who first suggested the idea of tax-supported public schools so everyone, rich and poor, could receive a free education. Although public schools have now become totally secularised and God isn't allowed in many of them these days, they were in fact a Christian innovation. It was a Christian, Johann Sturm, who introduced the idea of graded education. A Christian, Friedrich Froebel, instigated the kindergarten concept. It was people like Abbé Charles Michel de la Paix, Thomas Galloday and Laurent Clerc who created sign language, simply motivated by the fact that deaf people should be able to hear the gospel of Jesus. Christians initiated education for the blind as well. Louis Braille, who created the Braille system that allowed the blind to read, saw his work as a divine mission. When the poor didn't take advantage of free education, it was a Christian, Robert Rakes, who started the idea of Sunday school so that everyone could receive at least some kind of instruction one day a week. In the United States, every American college founded in the colonies prior to the Revolutionary War, except the University of Pennsylvania, was established by a self-identified branch of the Christian Church. Even by 1932, 92% of the 182 colleges and universities in America were founded by self-identified Christian denominations, that is, a body claiming to represent and be moved by faith in Christ. Again, God isn't welcoming some of them anymore, but they wouldn't have existed at all without Christians being motivated by their faith to create a better world. The world now enjoys the benefits, but hates the source of the benefits. 
And then finally, who could forget Christians like William Wilberforce, who spent his whole life fighting to abolish the slave trade in the British Empire? As the first to achieve this goal, he opened up the path for the same thing to happen around the world, and millions of people from that day forth were spared the horror and indignity of slavery. Or what about the Baptist preacher Martin Luther King Jr., who was the first to take a real stand for racial equality in the USA, and who changed the attitudes of a nation by peaceful means because of his commitment to Christian principles? Luther King Jr. stood in contrast to the Muslim Malcolm X, who had no hesitation in advocating violence, anti-Semitism and racism for his cause. We haven't really scratched the surface of how the message of Christ has changed the world via his followers, and I've skimmed over the details for the sake of brevity. So no wonder historian Kenneth Scott Latourette said, As the centuries pass, the evidence is accumulating that, measured by his effect on history, Jesus is the most influential life ever lived on this planet. H.G. Wells wrote, I am an historian, I am not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very centre of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all history. James C. Heffley wrote, I am within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, and all the navies that were ever built, and all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man upon earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. If Jesus had never lived, and if his followers hadn't been so committed to the cause of putting faith into action, spreading the gospel like they have, the world would never have eradicated all the evils described above. Kenneth L. Woodward, writing in Newsweek, said, Because Christianity's influence is so pervasive throughout much of the world, it is easy to forget how radical its beliefs once were. And that's exactly it. Christianity once seemed radical because it looked totally different to the evil cultures into which it entered, like a midday sky compared to a midnight sky. But gradually, through its followers, Christianity changed those cultures and created new moral norms. Christianity slowly made the world brighter. We now take the light by which we live for granted, forgetting the place from where it came. But look into this issue in any depth and you will quickly find that Christianity has been the driving force of civilization for thousands of years. Indeed, it continues to civilize the world and bring dignity, hope and freedom wherever it goes today, whether that be with jungle tribes or on city streets. Take the Street Pastors Initiative, for example, where Christian volunteers look to bring Christ into the city centres of Great Britain. They go out onto the streets at night, particularly to city centres where lost and broken people are stumbling out of bars, drunk, upset and fighting. On the 23rd of April 2010, BBC News reported that in Northamptonshire, England alone, police recorded a 65.5% reduction in crime on the previous year as a direct result of this Christian influence on the streets. You'll find roughly the same figures in every town where Street Pastors operates. In the year 2000, the Social Capital Community Benchmark Survey was undertaken by the universities of the USA, and it discovered that if two people, one religious and one atheist, are identical in every other way, economically, socially and politically, the atheist is 23% less likely to give to charity and 26% less likely to volunteer their time to good causes. God civilizes people. Now here's a map released by Transparency International showing national corruption levels around the world. Yellow signifies the least corrupt countries and red signifies the most corrupt. Although there are many factors to take into consideration, just a quick glance at the map reveals that the least corrupt nations are those with a Christian heritage. The top 12 least corrupt nations from 2011, along with their predominant religion as given by the ARDA, are as follows. New Zealand, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Singapore, Norway, Netherlands, Australia, Switzerland, Canada, Luxembourg and Hong Kong. Ten out of the top twelve least corrupt nations have a predominantly Christian heritage. Now, even though these percentages represent nominal figures, it is no coincidence that corruption has fallen wherever Christianity has had the most historical influence. Even the two anomalies, Hong Kong and Singapore, can perhaps be explained by the fact that they once had a strong Christian influence in their days as British colonies. Christianity has even changed the way we speak. 
when we say we have given up the ghost or talk about being the salt of the earth or talk about putting words into each other's mouths or being a law unto yourself or talk about a little bird telling me a secret, we are often unknowingly quoting the Bible. The King James Bible in particular is widely regarded to be the most influential book on the English language of all time, even more influential than the works of Shakespeare, and the Bible is also well known to be the best-selling book of all time. The Word of God has gone round the globe, bringing light to anyone who reads it. The fact that non-believers use phrases from the Bible, often without knowing that's where they originated, is a perfect example of a much bigger truth. That the world adheres to biblical morals without knowing that they originated with God. Slavery is a perfect example. It was once very much embedded in culture and no one thought anything of it. It took William Wilberforce, a Christian, driven by Christ, working to Christian principles, giving his whole life to the fight to change the culture and set a new norm. Today, slavery is considered a self-evident evil, and the fact that its abolition was a primarily Christian accomplishment is totally forgotten. Instead, people vainly imagine that we have achieved moral progress by some natural evolutionary force. Nothing could be further from the truth. Christians fulfilling the Great Commission gave their lives to establish those moral advances. So the truth of the matter is that although atheists and many others around the world won't acknowledge it, they hold many of their best moral opinions simply because they have inherited and internalized truths that Christians had to fight to establish as cultural norms. It is because of Christian pioneers that Christian principles have permeated the atmosphere of our society. Pioneers like Paul of Tarsus, Wilberforce, Luther, Luther King Jr., and all those before and after them who revolutionized the inferior social morality of their time and set new standards. Fyodor Dostoevsky said, Even those who have renounced Christianity and attack it, in their inmost being still follow the Christian ideal. Finally, I want to emphasize that in almost all cases where Christians raised moral standards, they were in their own time hated and ridiculed by the culture they stood against. In Greco-Roman culture, Christians were hated because their adherence to a higher morality cast those around them in a bad light. Wilberforce was ridiculed and hated by all those slave ship owners whose income was threatened by his campaign. Christians who attempt to raise the moral climate will almost always experience this hatred. Light shows up darkness. But I'd like to think that there will always be those amongst our number willing to be hated by society to uphold God's moral principles for future generations, even if the source of those principles are then forgotten and hated by those who benefit from living in a better world. Mark Twain wrote, in the beginning of change, the patriot is a scarce man, and brave, and hated, and scorned. When his cause succeeds, the timid join him, for then it costs nothing to be a patriot. Albert Schopenhauer said, All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. You can see the point. It takes brave Christians to change things in the face of ridicule, hatred and scorn. And then after the battle is won, everyone else accepts the truth as self-evident and enjoys the benefits. Christians are called to be moral pioneers.